Welcome to the Brick Church YouTube channel. My name is Taylor and I get the great privilege of being your student pastor here at the Brick. And right now is like the perfect moment for you to go ahead and subscribe to the channel. It gives you the ability to know everything that's happening at the Brick Church. And our hope is, is that a resource to you. It's an opportunity for you to get everything you need to walk out what God's called you to as a fully devoted follower of Christ. So without further ado, let's lean into the message and hear what God has for us. Let's get this thing going. We are on a series called Mirror, Mirror. It's just a couple weeks long. I asked for three weeks, but they'll only give me two at a time. So uh, Jared could repair the damage in week three. Um, uh, but let's, before we get going, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're a good God. Lord, we're asking that you would show up in a mighty way. Father, we ask that your words would pierce our heart, that we would be more like you um, because we would see you more clearly today. Father, we have a, a, long, a greater appreciation um, for your son, Jesus, and that we would have a desire on our heart to be more like him. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So um, uh, all cards on the table. This is not a very long message. That's why I just prayed kind of long, um, uh, so you don't feel like you're standing up as soon as you sit down. Uh, but uh, it is called um, Mirror, Mirror, and I want to kind of play or mess around with like a natural mirror, and then actually what we're fixing to read, um, what Scripture calls a mirror is actually itself. So the book of James, we'll get to in a second, actually calls the Word of God a mirror that we're supposed to look into so we can see ourselves clearly. And uh, natural mirrors, I don't know um, if you looked into one today. I honestly can't tell because the lights are so bright, but maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Um, but if you looked into one today, it kind of told you what you looked like, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and it, maybe you made some adjustments off of what you saw. Well, that's what we're going to talk about too, is that when you see this and we open this up and we see what it has to say about us, then we can make some adjustments. But mirrors are interesting things because they do show you things that you need to correct, but that's not really what I want to hit today when it comes to the Word of God being a mirror. Actually, I want to hit well, how God sees you. Like when you look in the mirror, like and you look at Scripture and you're thinking, man, there's no way that I can actually measure up to this. I want you to see that God actually already sees you that way. Like all the things that God has said about you, He already sees you that way. And real mirrors tell you things that you need to correct. And I don't mean that the Bible is not good for reproof and correction, but today um, I'm not trying to balance the scales. I'm actually full sending this idea that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, that you have right standing with God. And that's what I want to hit today. And again, it won't be uh, long, but mirrors are weird. Cause like this morning when I looked in the mirror, uh, the first thing I ever began to recognize is that I was already sweating and I had put two different kinds of deodorants on already. And I was like, I'm, I'm already sweating. I put sunscreen on at the ball game all all day yesterday, my face was already red. Um, if all cards are on the table, um, I even dabbed some of my wife's makeup on this morning just so I can kind of hide some of that. Um, mirrors are wild like that, you know what I'm saying? And uh, this mirror, however, is actually a mirror that produces peace. This mirror produces hope. It produces faith. It will heal your soul. So when we're talking about mirror, mirror, we're talking about God's word as a mirror. So Let's jump into the book of James chapter one, uh, James one, 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, this word doer um, can also mean someone that is a believer and you believe it so much that you go and do it. So if someone hears the word, but doesn't believe it enough to go and do it, this is what it's talking about. He is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, referencing scripture, it calls it the perfect law, says looks intently at it and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man, this person will be blessed in what he does. Scripture is um, painting a picture that's wild. James is talking about somebody that looks in the mirror and then walks away and forgets that their hair was brown. Looks in the mirror and walks away and forgets that, that their shirt is gray. I had to double check. But forgets that their shirt is gray. It's painting this picture of somebody who stares intently at a mirror, recognizes that they have blue eyes, walks away. Someone says, what color are your eyes? And they're like, I don't know. How wild would that be? Like, that would be wild. They walk in and they notice something about themselves. They're like, what color is your hair? And maybe they don't know because it's been a while since they've seen it. But you know what I'm saying? Like, what, what, they look in a the mirror. There's some facts the mirror tells them. They turn around and they forget the facts. And James is saying this person that looks into this mirror and they look at it 
in when God tells them a truth about themselves. They are like that person. When God says that they have been made whole and they walk away and they feel all of the reasons why they're not a whole person. And they feel all of the reasons why they don't feel like they have actually been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. They feel all the reasons. They're reminded of all the things that they've been a part of that disqualify them from this life that God has promised us. And James says that person is a forgetful hearer. He says, but don't be that person. Be the person that looks into this and then looks into this and then looks into this until it gets down in your heart. And I want to I wanna be honest. Um, I recognize that there are some other things and some other practices that might be necessary depending on where you're at emotionally or physically than just picking a scripture, reading it, and just saying, okay, God's going to change everything in my life because I read a scripture. But today, again, we have a really healthy culture here at the Brick, so things will get balanced out. I'm just going to full send um, what I have to say today so they can really get down deep in your heart. So that's what I want to do. But the Word of God is absolutely a mirror. Uh, Here's one of my favorite things that God says about us, and let's just work with this today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that is grafted in, joined to him by faith, in him as Savior, he is the new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition have passed away. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings a new life. I love this scripture. Um, The term right here says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, I want you to know that the term in Christ, in him or in whom shows up 70 times in the New Testament. It's a positional term. This is God letting us know that in Christ is actually where we should live. It's a, it's a place that we should dwell, meaning that when this truth becomes real to us, God said, live there in Christ, in the reality of what Christ did for you, in the reality of what the blood of Jesus did for you. That's where God wants us to live. But it's a wild scripture to me because that you are a new creation. And then I'm wrestling with staring in this mirror and trying to get a hold of the fact that I am a new creation. And it says that the old things have passed away. They're buried. But those old things that 2 Corinthians say are buried, they show up in my life all of the time. Like that old way of doing things. It just pops up randomly. All of my old tendencies, they'll come out really quick if I don't watch them. I was in a store the other day, yesterday actually, and they had a little robot vacuum. And I don't know if you've seen these things. We have one in our house. It just gets stuck under the chairs all the time. That's all it does. Um, but this one was kind of big. And I'm in the store getting a drink. And the robot vacuum hit me in the leg. And without thinking about it, I just kicked it. I just kicked the snot out of that thing because it hit me right in the leg. Um, I know that's kind of silly. But what I'm saying is, is that we've got tendencies that will try to come up. God, if I'm a new creation, how come every now and then... Uh, I don't know what yours is. I, 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 don't, I don't know, but how come every now and then I, and then fill in the blank, angry with my kids, fill in the blank, mean to my spouse, fill in the blank, don't look in the mirror. I mean, it could be a, a number of different things. I, I'm wrestling all the time still, and I've been doing this for a little while now, that if I'm a new creation, how come that old man, that old person is always trying to show up on the front door? And here's what I realized this, is that Jesus put him in the grave, but Ryan keeps him there. I'm the one that's responsible for keeping him there. When it tries to rise up, I'm at the ball field yesterday, and I don't know if you knew this, but if you go to a youth ball game, that's the best place for your flesh to rise up. Um, I, I mean, you just want to do all kinds of wild stuff when you're there. And I'm sitting there, and I'm not even recognizing it, but I'm, I'm, I'm eating my sunflower seeds one at a time, just one, and I'm cracking it open. I'm pulling the seed, and I'm putting it in my mouth. And a guy comes by, and he's like, is that how you normally eat seeds? And I was like, no, that's not how I normally eat seeds. I usually put half the bag in my mouth and spit them out. But today, I need to concentrate on something because I was letting myself know, Ryan, you don't have to say nothing to nobody. You don't have to touch nobody. You don't have to let them feel you. You don't have to let them see you. I know they're wild. I'm trying to keep this old man in check. Ryan, and I even said this out loud to myself at one time, you're preaching tomorrow, and there are iPhones out here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like... They'll catch this really quick. Um, But if I'm a new creation, why do I feel like that? Like if I'm a new creation, then why do I feel like that? Because that is the struggle of being a Christ follower is that you've got to train yourself to look in this mirror more than you do your natural one. Now, I I, I don't mean that... uh, that don't look in your natural one. Like, get your hair. You know, you know what I'm saying? Get, get all those things right. What I'm saying is, is this is what we have to learn to trust. And I don't mean you can flip a switch, and when God says you're a new creation, all of a sudden you never have a struggle. But I do mean that we can start to look in the mirror more. I said more. 
and to remind ourselves more. Um, I was in the back, and I heard Taylor talking about how we should repeat some truths till they get down deep on the inside of us. And this is one of those truths. I'm a new creation. The old man, the old lady, the old person has passed away. Rise up. No, they've passed away. They've passed away. they passed away. Yeah, and then I don't have to kick the robots. No, I'd probably still kick a robot. That doesn't bother me at all. I, I enjoyed that. I don't know how smart that robot was. It may have been intentional. <laughs> in him, in whom, in Christ, 70 times. I think God's trying to get a message to us that we're, we're different now even when we don't feel different. We're new even when we feel old. I said we're new even when we feel old. And what I want you to know is that your insufficiencies that you feel actually aren't tied to your pattern of life or even to your performance, although you may feel like that, they're tied to your humanity. That you can be acing it for a long time and you would still think the same things and you would still battle some of the same things. Um, so that's why di Christ died on a cross for your humanity and he redeemed you. And I'm gonna say that a couple of times today, but that word redeemed just means he bought you back. I said he bought you back. Yeah, and you were like, what, did, what do you mean he bought me back? I didn't know. No, no, sin owned our lives. And Christ, 2,000 plus years ago, bought us back. He bought us back. I'll give you a little history that you might know or you may not know. Um, first two people on earth, Adam and Eve, uh, they sinned in the garden. They had it made. They sinned in the garden, ate the apple, and then the debt kept growing. Have you ever went out to eat with a group of people maybe, and then... They're kind of flexing on who's going to buy the meal. Has that ever happened? If you have cheap friends, this has never happened to you. Um, but if you don't, like, like they're like, oh, I'll get it this time. Oh, you got it last time. I do that all the time. Oh, rock, paper, scissors, see who pays. I, and, you know, stuff like that and stuff like that. Well, um, what I want you to know is, is that since Adam and Eve, there was a debt on our lives that we couldn't wash enough dishes in the restaurant to pay. It was there. And then here's God in heaven, and he's looking down. And there's a man named Abraham who comes across. I'm going to say something, Abraham. He's a good guy. Matter of fact, he's dubbed the father of our faith. That's a pretty good name for God to give somebody. Father of our faith. But Abraham's old man, he, he lied. He was a liar. He told somebody that his wife was his sister. That is wild. Do not do that. But he said, my wife is my sister. Uh, he was a liar. Um, and then after Abraham, there came a guy and his name was Moses. And Moses was a great deliverer of God's people in Egypt. He delivered the whole people of Israel, delivered them out. But he couldn't quite measure up because he got angry. He got angry and he got mad and the debt kept climbing. That afternoon there was a man named Elijah and Elijah called down fire from heaven. Can you imagine what that would be like? And then less than a week later, he wanted to quit. Like I can resonate with that. I mean, fire from heaven, boom, God showed up, big way. A little bit later, I'm out, I'm done. The debt kept climbing. Even a man named David, whose scripture said he was a, God, he was a man with God's own heart. He had a heart like God's. Let his old self rise up and then he had an impure heart impurity got in his heart. So you had all of this going on. The debt is still climbing. And then God sent his son, Jesus, to die on a cross. And here's where I want to hone in today. And I know that this terminology, it may feel old to you because you may not have heard it in a while, but if you've never heard it, that's great. It'll be brand new to you. But God sent his son, Jesus, and we'll say he died on a cross. And yet last week we celebrated that he rose from the grave. And now scripture tells us he's like in heaven. Um, he's an intercessor on our behalf. And he's up there fighting for us in heaven. But we can't skip the part on the cross where Jesus bled. I said he bled. Blood came out. Because, see, there was a price that had to be paid for that debt. God didn't say, now Jesus came down here and it's a sinless life. I'm just going to wipe this thing out. No, Jesus, he didn't spill his blood. He shed his blood. There was no accident involved. He didn't trip and land on the cross. He shed his blood for us. There was a high price paid for us to be redeemed, for us to be bought back, for us to be bought back. My grandma... Well, she'd be my, my great-grandma. She used to sing. She would watch me when I was little. And she would put me in her lap, and she would sing. And she was a horrible singer. But, yeah, but um, she would try to sing me to sleep. But if you can't sing, it's the opposite effect. Like, I just couldn't fall asleep. Um, but she would rock me back and forth, and she would sing old songs. And she would sing this song. She would say that um, he sought me, and he bought me with his redeeming blood. It's an old song called Victory in Jesus. And when I was young, that kind of got on the inside of me. So he sought me and he bought me 
with his redeeming blood. Listen, it wasn't just that God needed all these boxes to be checked so that now you can be a new creation. You were bought back. You were bought back. Your value is tied to the price that was paid for you and it was the precious spotless blood of Jesus Christ. There's one of my favorite parables. It may be my favorite parable in scripture. It's a story. And Jesus is talking about a man who's driving down a road and he's looking at land. And I can resonate with this because I've been driving around. I've been looking at land because I want to purchase some land. And on the land, if it's got like a good view, I like that. If it's got a big pond, then I can envision me and my, friend, my, my kids. You know, my kids, we're fishing that pond. And I'm, like, and I'm not coveting their land. I, I don't think that I am. But, uh, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just like, man, that would be a cool spot. So, you know, who owns it? Will they sell it? Stuff like that. Well, in Scripture, there's a guy. He's driving down the road. He's looking at land. And the, the Scripture calls him a merchant, meaning he was skilled in trade. And he sees a property, and there is a pearl in the middle of the property. Scripture calls it a pearl of great price. And the man looked at the pearl, and he wanted the pearl so much that he found out who owned the land, and he bought the whole property so he can get the pearl. And Jesus lets us know that we are actually the pearl, that we are mesmerizing to the merchant. And in, in order to get the pearl, he knew he was buying the dirt, he knew he was buying the mud. He knew he was buying the old man. He knew he was buying the old self. He knew what he was getting into when he purchased the pearl. You are a pearl of great price. And today, I'm not concerned with you considering yourself um, thinking too highly of yourself. That's the, I, I, if, if we need to correct that later, we'll correct that. Right now, I'm trying to get you out of the ditch and let God build an escalator in your heart that brings you up to a higher opinion of who you are in Christ. I want you to lose your, you, you are recognizing and you are identifying with all the behavior traits you have that seem like they keep showing up. And I'm trying to get you rid of that sin consciousness and get a right standing with God conscious to where you can actually get through the sin to where you look in this mirror and God said, I'm a new creation. And everything else is saying the opposite, but I'm going to choose to believe what God is saying. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming, his buying back blood. He bought me back. He bought me back. I had uh, the guy that was playing the drums this morning. His name is Jason. And Jason and I uh, grew up together. And Jason's mom, her name is Patty, and we all called her Mama Patty. And Patty was one of the first people that kind of pointed out to me that there may be a, hey man, maybe you want to consider actually surrendering your life to Jesus and seeing if he has a call on your life. I was like, Patty, you're wild. There's no chance. There's, there's not. And she brought it up real gently and she brought it up real gently. And Jason would tell me stories about how when he was younger and he was driving around and he would be somewhere he wasn't supposed to be, his mom would just call him and be like, Jason, I know where you're at. The Holy Spirit told me, come home. And, uh, and what you need to know is before there was Life 360 or Find Friends, there were moms who prayed. And, uh, and they, they, could, they, would, they would find you really quick somehow. Um, uh, but anyways, that's, that, that, that's how she would do. And then Patty, uh, when I grew up, I would hear Patty use this terminology. Um, she would say, I plead the blood. And I was like, what does that even mean? You plead the blood? Like, I don't even like paper cuts, let alone I don't want to be pleading no blood. Um, but then what I found out is there's not like a whole lot of scriptural reference for that terminology other than maybe in Exodus. But what she was meaning is, is that there's a power in the blood and I pleaded over my kids. I, I pleaded over my life. I pleaded over my family. That blood is just as strong today as it was on Calvary's hill when they walked up on the place called Galgotha, which means place of the soul and the skull and our savior bled his last drop out. That blood is still just as strong when it comes to how it forgives you and redeems you. As many times as you need to feel its power, it is still just as strong. And Patty would walk around and she'd be like, I plead the blood. And it was weird if you brought friends to church. I don't know if you know that. But like it, it, people, when I grew up, they didn't need a microphone to walk on stage and start talking. And you know, they just, I plead the blood. I, I just plead. And it was kind of awkward growing up. But the, the sentiment, the ideology behind it, I believe is, is true. That there is, there's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. And for you to feel like a new creation, I think first you need to place um, the importance on that blood that bought you back. Because if you don't value the price that was paid for you, then you won't value who you are in your new in Christ life right now. You first got to put value on that blood that was shed for you. First Peter chapter one, it says this. It says, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, 
a lamb without blemish or defect. A lamb without blemish or defect. I don't have a problem with silver and gold, but it, but it does perish. First Peter is letting us know that the price that you were paid with was an imperishable price. The blood of Jesus is why you are a new creation. So even when you don't feel like you are a new creation, I get back in this mirror and I find out what it says. And when I feel like the old man and I think I see the old man, I get back in this mirror. And listen, I love how accessible God's word has been made. You can get on an app and you can get in it, but my only concern would be, I say, let's still make it more and more accessible. But sometimes when you can get to something so easy, you forget to put the proper value on it. When I grew up, people would talk about the importance of having your nose in the book all of the time. And you just don't hear it as much anymore because it's so easy to grab a hold of. But this is the mirror that shows you what God has said about you. And if you want to overcome the obstacles that are in your life, you need to get this in front of you long enough to start believing it. It needs to become the reality or the term would be the redemptive reality, the reality for who you are now that you've been bought back. It's a redemptive reality. This is who you are now. Now the blood of Jesus has bought you back. This is who you are. Redemptive reality. I got a scripture I want to share. I'm going to give you a heads up. It is a lot of verses. It really is, but I knew the sermon would, be, sermon would be short, so I had to throw something in there with a little meat. So uh, it's a lot, and it's poetic, but no, I, I hope it ministers to you, and I'll, I'll try to read it, and we'll go from there. Romans chapter 3. It says, For we all have sinned are in need, and are in need of the glory of God. Uh, more popular translations would say, For we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we know that. Let's see what else it says. Yet through his powerful declaration of acquittal, God freely gives away his righteousness. His gift of love and favor now cascades over us, all because Jesus, the anointed one, has liberated us from the guilt, punishment, and power of sin. Jesus, God given destiny, was to be the sacrifice to take away sins, and now he is our mercy seat because of his death on the cross. We come to him for mercy, for God has made a provision for us to be forgiven by faith in the sacred blood of Jesus. Just a little more. This is the perfect demonstration of God's justice covered, um, excuse me, justice, because until now, he had been so patient, holding back his justice out of his tolerance for us. So he covered over the sins of those who lived prior to Jesus' sacrifice. And when the season of tolerance came to an end, there was only one possible way for God to give away his righteousness and still be true to both his justice and his mercy, to offer up his own son. So now because we stand on the faithfulness of Jesus, God declares us righteous in his eyes says there was only one way for God to satisfy both his justice and his mercy, to show them both in one act. And that was for his son Jesus to die on a cross and bleed spotless blood. Your worth is tied. I said it's tied to what was paid for you. And when you can't hardly convince yourself that it's time for you um, to move further into your call for Christ, I would say, look in the mirror. Come on, just look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. See what it has to say about you. There's a book, Psalms in the Testament, 107 in the Old Testament, and it says this. It says, let the redeemed tell their story. Let those that have been bought back from Christ tell their story. And that would be my charge for you today. Some translations even say, let the redeemed say so, but I like this one a little better. Let the redeemed tell their story. And what that means is, is if you've been bought back, even if you've got to tell it to yourself first, make sure that you tell your story. So my story is a series of me actually slipping and getting back up and slipping and getting back up and slipping and getting back up. Well, then tell somebody about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and let them know how he has always held on to you, how he's always held you and how he's always been there. You say, I get hot and I get cold. I get hot and I get cold and I'll get in church and I'll get out of church. Well, tell somebody that every time you showed up, you found out that his justice was sacrificed on the cross of Christ and all you felt was mercy. Tell your story. But get in the book, and get your story straight first. Get it right first. You've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You are a new creation. What God's book is telling you, what this mirror is telling you, that you've been made healed and whole, no matter what you feel like. And I wanna share, you know, I've been, a, I've been on a pretty good spot spiritually for a long time now, and I'm not trying to flex. I'm just saying like, I've been on a pretty good spot, in a pretty good spot to where I've, I feel like God just had me in a good, like by the grace of God, I've just been in a good flow for, for, for quite a while right now. And then even though I've been in a good flow, before I step up here, 
specifically like when I'm waiting for everybody to get here, or I'm here early in the morning. Um, I fight off this feeling oftentimes, not every time I hit the stage, but oftentimes been in a good flow. And I fight off this feeling that Ryan, you are an imposter. And I'm not talking about being an imposter because I'm having to chew sunflower seeds not to say something or because I kicked a robot. I'm talking about feeling like an imposter because I recognize how unqualified in myself I am to be up here. I recognize the times that I made decisions um, that if it wasn't for the grace of God, I shouldn't even be here right now. I get up here and I feel like an imposter. I'm just being honest with you. And you know, and, I, and you gotta work through that. And it's not every time, but it was this morning. And I'm getting here and I'm like, I'm gonna tell people about the blood of Christ. And I don't even feel like a new creation right now. And I'm telling you, I have to tell you this. I've been in a good spot. I still feel this way. Your inadequacies are not tied to your performance. They're tied to the fact that you are human. You are a human being. And with that humanity and that fallen state comes those things that you feel that disqualify you. And I don't care if you slipped up this morning, put that old man back in the grave and get up here. And even if you feel like an imposter, if it looks like you raising your hands during worship, if it looks like you giving during the tithe, even though you know you've been greedy, if it looks like you being nice tonight to your spouse, even though you were cranky this morning, I don't care what kind of imposter you feel like, get your nose in the mirror. I'm a new creation. I'm going to activate it on right now. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what he said. Yeah, and then you go back and you're like, man, I missed it again. Well, you know what you're going to do? You're going to do what the blood does for you. You're going to ask for forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah, if, if anything, a new creation shouldn't look like us getting it right all the time. It should look like us righting our wrongs all the time. Yeah, we should be the first people to right our wrongs. Yeah, we should be the first people to go and say, you know what? Yeah, I, I feel that imposter syndrome kicking in. I, I know that there are people that would believe that I'm disqualified from being up here on this stage and I'm doing everything I can not to agree with them. And how am I going to pull that off? I'm just going to look in a mirror. I'm saying, say, all right, God, what do you have to say about me? What do you have to say about me? When greed hits my heart, God, what, what did you say? When impurity tries to jump in my life, God, what did you say about Ryan? What did you say about Ryan, when I slip and when I fall and I don't want to, but when it happens, God, what does your mirror say about me? Because that's the truth that I want. That's the one that I'm going to hold on to, not these inferior things that I feel. I'm going to look in the mirror over and over again until these truths get deep down on the inside of me. Stop letting your past be the reason you don't take steps towards fulfilling the God, call of God on your life. Here's what I know. is that When your future is ready, your past starts calling. I said, when, when God has ready for you next, when it's prime, ready for you to step into it, that's when that old man starts trying to climb out of that casket and remind you of all these other things. Quiet him down, put him in place, take the steps that God has put in for your life. Uh, man, be the husband and be the dad you're called to be right now. And I don't care what you struggle with, just go ahead and do it right now. Take that step. And when you fail, take another step. Be the person that you've been called to be. Be the coworker, be the friend, be, the per be who God has called you to be right now. You're pre-qualified to take the step. And when you feel scared, you feel unworthy. Welcome to the club. All of us that do things that you think you could never do, fight those same feelings before we do it. By the grace of God, maybe we just looked at this book and we took it and we stepped and we took it and we stepped and we fell. We told our story that we were imperfect, but every step of the way, he was not. He was absolutely perfect and good and full of mercy. And that's the story you'll tell. And I want you to have that story, but you don't have that story just because I have that story. You have that story when you look in the mirror and you take the step to what you've been called to do. Whatever it is, just go do it. Man, I feel a freedom just to speak. And I don't mean to be so bold or brash when I say that, but just go do it today. Like today, today's your day. Just go ahead and do it. Yeah. Do it scared. Do it broken. Do it imperfect. Do it how you are. Don't have to change your clothes first. Don't have to fix anything first. You don't have to put makeup. Don't, no, no, no. Don't change right, right now where you're at. Just go ahead and take that step and do it before you leave. And maybe that's baptism. Sign up today. Don't wait till next week. Maybe that's going to Brick group. Sign up today. Don't wait till next week. Whatever that step is, we've got sign up sheets in the lobby. Sign up today. Take that step. Know that when you feel insecure about it, that's your past calling. That means your future's ready. Go take that step today. Go take that step today in the name of Jesus. You're like, what if they're going to look at you? Well, who can? First off here, they won't, but who cares? 
Who cares? What if they walked with me when I did it? Who cares? What if I committed before and I left them high and dry? Who cares? It's about you and the blood of Jesus and God. And what that merchant did is he bought that whole field. Do you know why? Because you were in it. You were in it. Yeah, let's move today, guys. I don't know what that move looks like for you, but let's do it today. Let's make the move. Let's call, let's apologize, let's repent, let's get it right, let's make some adjustments, whatever it is, let's do it today. The blood is just as strong as it was when he dropped that last drop on Calvary's Hill. Would you bow your heads today? We are so excited that you're here today. If you heard that message and you feel like God's calling you to take the next step of trusting your life to him, then what we would love for you to do is text the phrase, I have decided. And what it does, it lets us know we can reach out to you so that we can help you understand that this is not a life you've been called to walk alone, but there's a community here at the Brit Church that wants to walk alongside you as you become everything that God has called you to be. And again, we want to say thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. It's allowing us to take this message so much more than just four walls, but to the world. And if you're really passionate about being a part of that and you want to give to us financially to partner with what God's doing at the Brick Church, then what you can do is you can text the phone number on the screen. And that's going to link you to a credit card, a debit card, or a bank account. But however you give, as a church, we say thank you so much. There are lives all over the world that are different because of what you are a part of here today. And we love you so much. We hope you have a beautiful week and we can't wait to see you next time.